Nobody is sure about their future, but whether you are young or old, man or woman, rich or poor, there is one certainty you cannot escape, and that is everyone in this room and on this earth is going to die. What we don't know is when, where, and how. It is inevitable. Where death is concerned, we realize that God is not partial to anyone. Let us pause and reflect what we mean by death. Is it when our heart stops functioning or when we stop living happily and joyously? To me, slow death is when we stop living joyously, are not at peace with ourselves and with others, and are constantly bitter and negative. What matters is not how many years we live on this earth, but the quality of our life. In a short span of life, I have lost many dear ones, and these events made me read and reflect and attend a meditation program. Instead of turning bitter and negative, I have got a sense of peace and wholesomeness. My talk is based on my personal experience of death. Like most of us here, I dreaded the thought of death, especially of my near and dear ones. I had a magical belief that if I touched wood, God would save me from any, un any unpleasant event. Let me give you an example of how paranoid I was. Before the Mumbai-Pune expressway was built, and when my husband and I ever traveled between Pune and Mumbai, and anything unpleasant was said, I would make him stop the car, find a tree, and go and touch it. But today, I know that even if I carry the entire forest with me, I cannot change my destiny. In 1996, at the age of 60, my husband, Roynton, at the peak of his professional career, died of a heart attack. 14 months later, my pet dog died. A few days later, my mother-in-law, who was 97 and suffering for years and wanting God to take her away, passed away. And within a week, my son, who was 25, with his whole life ahead of him, was killed in a car accident. The pain that I experienced when my husband had died receded into insignificance compared to how I felt when my son died. My daughter, Meher, and her husband, Feroz, had been to, were living in England, and I had promised them that when they had their first baby, I would spend six months with them. When I got back after enjoying my grandson, my husband came from Pune to Mumbai to receive me because he was delighted to have me back after six months. But before he could reach the airport, he had a massive heart attack. At the airport, I received not him, I was received not by him, but by the news that he had passed away. Two days after my Roynton's death, the Thermax board met and decided that I should be the executive chairperson of the company. I felt inadequate to assume this responsibility, and that added to my sense of loss. After the death of my husband, I read many books on death, 
and that did help a little. But intellectual pursuits go uh, touch your head. What leads to release and transformation is the heart. <clears throat> For many years, I had heard of a Buddhist meditation program called Vipassana. I was attracted to it, but was worried whether I would be able to carry on for 10 days. Because the rules say you cannot talk, you cannot read, or you cannot write. In fact, my husband used to say, I'd love to see you quiet for 10 days. <laughs> uh, my husband's death had created a deep void in my life and I was seeking for some answers and decided to attend the meditation program. I went through a lot of turmoil, but as I struggled, I realized I have a choice to remain helpless, become, be wallow in my self-pity and add to my sense of inadequacy, or to take hold of my life and find inner strength from within. I also realize that after the death of a dear one, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Suffering happens when we repeatedly keep asking ourselves, why did this happen to me? Why has no answers and leads to greater misery? Like many people in this audience and in India, I was not used to living on my own. And when everyone from my house had passed away, I wanted to sell my bungalow and move out. But thank God I did not act impulsively. Today, I love being on my own and value my solitude. Society and religion prescribes how to mourn. We women tend to adhere to these rules, which at times add to our misery. One piece of advice. You decide how you will mourn, and for God's sake, stop living life, continuous living life to the full. I have attended four Vipassana programs and meditate daily. And some of the insights I've got, I'd like to share with you. Earlier in my talk, I had mentioned that death was inevitable. With the practice of meditation, I'm learning to discover that happiness and peace are also inevitable for all human beings. We create our own misery by being attached to pleasurable events and being averse to anything unpleasant. We have not internalized that nothing is permanent in this world and happiness and unhappiness will come and go and we need to accept them with awareness and equanimity. When we learn to accept life as it unfolds, we will not go through roller coaster rides one day high and one day be in the dumps. We will learn to internalize the saying, this too shall pass. Most people refer to death as a tragedy or a disaster. The nature of the sun is to rise and to set each day. Would you label the sunset as a tragedy? The nature of life is to be born and to die. And yet, we who are not prepared for this natural process look upon it as a tragedy. To me, not getting along with people when they are alive and not investing in relationships which are important is a tragedy. The disaster is when we stop growing emotionally and spiritually by not questioning our old ways. We have learned to lavish our love and attention on a very few chosen ones called the family. We forget 
that nothing can stop us from reaching out to hundreds of people who are hungry for our affection. We again come up with self-limiting beliefs that after a certain age, making close friends is not possible. I have continuously challenged myself and pushed myself to change. For example, I've been able to add new, meaningful friendships all along life's journey, and that has deeply enriched my life. My son had three very good friends, and they had made a pact that they will attend each other's weddings. After my son's death, the friends asked me to represent him, and I have been to the US, UK, and Cyprus. When I was attending the wedding in the UK, the friend asked if I would mind saying a few words at his church wedding. He warned me that some of the things talked about death, and I said, that's perfectly all right. But when I went up to speak, the thought that kept going through my head was, if my son had been present, I would not be here. And to my great surprise, I kept sobbing. I was a little surprised, but not at all embarrassed. Very often, we do not put energy into relationships that matter and end up feeling very guilty when that person dies. Guilt is a very difficult emotion to deal with. I have learned to have a big sense of humor and laugh at myself and my imperfections because our stay on this earth is short. Our roles, dispensable, and our impact, inconsequential. I have learned to embrace life through the experience of death. I would like to end with a little story. I was walking down yesterday, and I don't know whether it was Shaniwa Peth or Aga Khan Palace, somewhere I was walking, and I suddenly encountered God. I took this opportunity to go up to her. Surprisingly, God is her, a woman. <laughs> I went up to her and I said, God, I'm very angry with you. You have prepared us for the birth of a child. You make a woman pregnant for nine months, so we are ready for that birth. But you have not prepared us for death. And God laughed and laughed, and she said, how stupid can human beings be? From the time you are born, I've told you you are going to die. You don't listen to me, and you call me insensitive. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs>